God of the people of Israel, the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Revealing yourself in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, you reached out into our world, coming down in Him to be one of us, to share our lives and to experience our lot. To share our suffering, to share the burdens of our lives, and then ultimately on the cross, in your own dear Son, to take the burden and the weight and the awfulness of our sin upon Himself. You who are all splendor and all glory, you who are pure light and delightful holiness, you who are beauty and tenderness, you who are love and gentleness and kindness, you whose Father's heart beats continually for us and loves us with a never-ending love, whose hands are gentle and kind, whose words are always calling out to us, reaching out to us, beckoning us always to come back to you, because you are our Father and you want us. You never like to see us turn our backs upon you and wander off into the paths and into the passageways and into the hallways of darkness. You never like us to see us shielding our eyes from you and looking upon the other gods of darkness or to be dazzled by the things that take our fascination and make us wander away from you. How your heart must have bled and we sought in the piercing of the side of your own dear son. Your heart bled as his hands bled and as his side bled and as his feet bled. He bled for us in suffering and in agony reflecting the bleeding of your heart for us but also to be the ultimate sacrifice taking upon himself the sins that we continually commit that would in the end banish us eternally from your presence he took our sins upon himself and became the lamb of sacrifice so that we might be forgiven so we turn from our paths of wanderings we turn our eyes and our hearts back towards you we lift up our faces towards you we lift up our arms and we cry out to you O oh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, the God of Israel. You have said that you are the Lord and that apart from you there is no Savior. And in your dear Son you have revealed that to us and Jesus came and walked amongst us. You are not some foreign God. You are our precious and loving Father our gracious Father. And so help us, O oh Lord, as we worship here this morning. Bind us together with your cords of love. So move amongst us by the presence of your Spirit. So bind our hearts together by the work of your Spirit that you will bind us to you by the work of your Spirit. Cleanse us as we worship. Bind us to you. And open our eyes by the work and influence of your Holy Spirit so that our hearts may rejoice and we may be glad to be the children of God. For we pray that in the name of Jesus Christ, 
whom you designated to be the Savior of the world, and in whose name we pray. Amen. And so we come to our scripture readings. First of all from John's first letter and then from the Gospel of John. The text that we're going to look at today is from the first verse of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. So as we hear the readings of the scriptures just have those words at the back of your mind because that's what we're going to look at today. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, I pray today that we all give thanks and I especially give thanks that you have spoken to us through your word and that you sent your son Jesus Christ to give us life, life to the full. Thank you Lord Jesus. Amen. The first reading is from 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 to 10. The word of life. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete, walking in the light. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us, from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. Amen. The second reading is from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was already with God in the beginning. Everything came into existence through Him. Not one thing that exists was made without Him. He was the source of life, and that life was the light for humanity. The light shines in the dark, and the dark has never extinguished it. God sent a man named John to be his messenger. John came to declare the truth about the light, so that everyone would become believers through his message. John was not the light, but he came to declare the truth about the light. The real light, which shines on everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world came into existence through him, yet the world didn't recognize him. He went to his own people, and his own people didn't accept him. However, he gave the right to become God's children to everyone who believed in him. These people didn't become God's children in a physical way, from a human impulse or from a husband's desire to have a child. They were born from God. 
The word became human and lived among us. We saw his glory. It was the glory that the father shares with his only son, a glory full of grace and truth. John declared the truth about him when he said loudly, This is the person about whom I said, The one who comes after me was before me, because he existed before I did. Each of us has received one gift after another, because all that the world, the word is. The teachings were given through Moses, but grace and truth came into existence through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. God's only Son, the one who is closest to the Father's heart, has made him known. Amen. Thank you. So last week we looked at this verse from Proverbs 29, where there is no vision, the people perish. The question then is, where do we look to find our vision, or on what do we base our vision? Because the, sorry, we can put up uh, the words, in the beginning was the word. So, the text on which we're going to base our thinking today is that first verse from John's Gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So on what do we base our thoughts? Where do we begin to look to find our vision? Because we are battered from every direction these days with all sorts of claims for our attention. People or institutions or various schools of thought that say to us, this is the basis on which you can start to build your life or your institution or the policy that the said government in whichever country can start to build its law, which becomes the policy of the country. Now, let me say that in South Africa we have a secular constitution which allows freedom of religion. So I don't want to attack that. We are able to exist as Christians because there is a secular constitution that allows us freedom of religion. So you can all have a quiet smoke of Dacha here if you like because <laughs> it's in your private place. But that's the kind of place that it eventually gets us. If we believe that Jesus says, and Jesus is revealed as the way, the truth, and the life, and we believe that that is a, a unique revelation, then that imposes upon us a responsibility. If we believe, as I used the words of the call to worship, from the prophet Isaiah that God is indeed the revealing God that he is the one who revealed himself to ancient Israel and then ultimately revealed himself to the world through Jesus Christ his son that makes the Christian faith unique amongst all the religions of the world it doesn't just make us one amongst many so, for example, Islam would say that Jesus is just a prophet. And Hinduism would say that he's just one of the other gods. So they're quite happy for him to go along. They're quite happy to live with Christianity because Jesus is just another one of the gods. So you can have as many gods as you like. Christians just happen to worship one of the gods. And Muslims would say that Jesus is just one prophet.
But we have what we call in Christianity the scandal of particularity. Where we believe that in fact there is only one God. And this sets us on a headlong collision, a head-on-head collision with all the other world religions. And it sets us on a collision course with paganism in whichever form it rears its head. So if we want to look at finding a vision for our church, for our own lives, for the country, we are narrowing down the field, the area in which we are going to look to find our vision. And that's why I want to move to these words at the beginning of John's Gospel. And in our day and age, and in the country in which we live, I believe that we have to be a lot more vigorous. And I will address myself to the denomination which we, which we belong. We need to be a lot more vigorous in our proclamation of the gospel to which we are giving our adherence. At my farewell service from Glenwood Corrugation, Nick Witt, our moderator, made some observations about where we find ourselves in the Christian church today. He said the landscape of the 21st century church has changed and has succumbed or yielded to an individualistic consumer faith. In other words, you can pick and choose And when he uses the word consumer, in other words, we can sell it off to the highest bidder. We're allowing the gospel to be modeled, fashioned, shaped into whatever form so that we can sell it. I'm not a fashion conscious person. I'm still wearing shoes that I started wearing when I was a student 46 years ago I wear some of my father's clothes and he's been dead over 40 years 20 years so I don't understand fashion eventually my middle son bought me new shoes to be buried and so so I don't understand but I do understand I do see what is happening to the way in which the gospel is being proclaimed We are fashioning and molding the gospel. In a one way we do, we have to proclaim the gospel so that people hear the gospel in their generation. In one way, that does have to happen. Does have to happen. And we also have to proclaim the the gospel to a particular culture. That does have to happen. But we can't shape it or form it in a way in which we can just have, can sell it for the sake of maximum profit. That is why I was saying last week that we cannot worship, we cannot make an idol of the bottom line in business. The bottom line is not an idol. Yes, business has to do with the bottom line. But there is a morality to the bottom line. If we have broken God's laws in reaching the bottom line, then we have to answer for that. And we are going through that process in our country and our dear brothers at Steinhoff. Yes, we have to run our businesses by the bottom line. But we cannot be immoral in getting to that place. And in the proclamation of the gospel... We cannot be immoral in the way in which we preach the gospel. And that is, those are the words we'll come to just now. Nick was saying, quoting Eugene Peterson, Religion in our day has been captured by the tourist mindset. The vocation of pastor has been replaced by the strategies of religious entrepreneurs with business plans. We have become shopkeepers, 
running shops. Our concern, how to keep the customers happy <coughs> and also how to lure customers away from competitors down the street. Fairly devastating words about how we're going about the work of proclaiming the gospel. I do believe that we have to become a lot more rigorous in our stance. My predecessors happened to come from north of the border. A particular border, that is. The battle cry of the clans was, Stand fast, Kragalachi! The Christian church is going to have to stand fast in face of all the things that are being brought to bear upon it, so that it changes its message in order to fit in with our consumer society of today. The gospel that we have in Jesus Christ, in fact, is the answer to the issues of our society. We don't sell it to fit in. It is the answer to the holiness and righteousness that our society has to come to terms with in order to function properly. So, where do we find our vision? How do we go about? Where do we tune in to find our vision? And John begins his gospel with these incredible words. Jesus, the Word, capital W, Jesus, the Word, Jesus, the Logos of God. And I'll explain all that. One can almost hear the deep, thunderous, sonorous organ notes of the opening words of John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There are echoes there of the opening of the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God. Already over time, but otherwise, who knows Reg Pierce's book, The Barrier of Spears? There's nothing you even read here. Do you know who Reg Pierce was? Oh, one person. Good. Famous headmaster of escort. He wrote the... I'm going to have to quote it to you now. He wrote that great book on the Drakensberg Mountains. And he make, uses the same words. Come from Ladysmith. You don't know who Dredge Pierce is. These deep sounding words that John uses almost from the beginning of Genesis. In the beginning, God. The parallel is almost too uncanny for us not to believe that there is indeed a parallel in John's mind between the beginning of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that there is a direct link in John's mind between these two passages. John is almost echoing, saying the same thing. I'm sure that all of you are familiar with this opening passage of John's Gospel. What is referred to as the prologue to this Gospel. It is a passage that we read every year at Christmas time. And I have to confess to you that even though I'm a great lover of the book of Jeremiah... When we come to the lesson of, uh, service of nine lessons and carols, I always preserve this passage to read for myself. I love this passage from the beginning of John's Gospel. However, there's far too much in this passage for us to deal with. And I just want to deal with this opening verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
William Barclay, in his commentary on John's Gospel, has this to say about chapter 1. The first chapter of the fourth Gospel is one of the greatest adventures of religious thought ever achieved by the mind of man. Well, if that's true, we're not going to get anywhere near that today. But there are deep things being said here by John. And if we're looking for where we need to anchor ourselves, this is the kind of place we have to come to. These are the words. These are the thoughts. This is the vision that we have to come to to build ourselves, to build the church, to build the nation. It's a difficult and deep subject. So we're only going to deal with it lightly. But we need to have John's Gospel and this opening section of John's Gospel in front of us all the time. Calvin, at the beginning of his commentary, summarizes what we're going to look at today. And it should give you a fairly good handle. He wrote, in this prologue, John declares Christ's eternal divinity to teach us that he is, that is Jesus is, the eternal God. That's why I'm saying, <coughs> we separate Christianity, the scandal of particularity. We are separated from all the other world religions. We're not just one of the Hindu religions. It's not just Jesus. God is not just one of the gods. He is not just one of the prophets. The Christian religion stands alone in this world. In the prologue, John declares Christ's eternal divinity to teach us that He is the eternal God manifest in the flesh. His object is to show that the restoration of mankind has to be accomplished by the Son of God. And again, that is what separates Christianity from all the other world religions. All the other world religions, man always has to somehow or other make satisfaction to God. We have to somehow or other do something to placate God, to make peace with God, to repay for our sins. And it is Christianity that says, in fact, we cannot. We have sinned so deeply, we will never be able to repay God. And so, and here's the grace. This, God comes Himself in the form of his son, and deals with that issue. And John is saying this at the beginning of his gospel. And this is why he identifies Jesus as the Logos, the Word of God, coming to be with us. And if you want a vision, where else do we go? His object is to show that the restoration of mankind has to be accomplished in the Son of God because by His power all things were created and He alone breathes life and energy into all creation. B.B. Warfield wrote of this verse, the first verse of the Gospel of John contains one of the most weighty statements of the deity of our Lord in the New Testament. So I want to use this verse. So, the first, the first part, in the beginning was the Word, the second part, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we can get some idea of who we're dealing with. John is saying to us that Jesus is the Word, the Logos, that's just the Greek, the Logos of God. John's Gospel opens in with this prologue, which takes us back 
into the depths of the eternal reality and tells us who and what this being actually is. Who is this Jesus? Whose life story in the world is now about to be told in this gospel. There's probably no more pregnant piece of writing in the world than this prologue to John's gospel. And there's no part of this pregnant prologue more pregnant than this first verse. There are just 17 words in it, and we can count only eight different words in that first sentence. But these few words are bursting with significance. And Warfield again says, when we read these three limpid sentences, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, we've read things, he says, which even the angels desiring to look into them might well despair of plummeting. In other words, it is just, they are just so rich in meaning. They so, the depth of these words is so great, we'll never exhaust the meaning of this verse. John is saying so much here for our good. To lead us, to guide us, to direct us. <coughs> Speaking of Jesus as the Word of God, John is making three assertions about Him. In the first, John declares Jesus' eternal existence. In the second, His eternal intercommunion with God. And in the third, His eternal identity. At various points in the gospel, Jesus says, I, just a little bit further, I and the Father are one. Jesus says, He who has seen me has seen the Father. And then, to go right to the end, during Jesus' trial, the high priest has Jesus on trial before Pontius Pilate. And he challenges Jesus and he says, Are you the Son of God? And Jesus says to him and to the court, You say, I am. Now the significance of those words are, I am. What we call the sacred Tetragrammaton. When God revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush and tells Moses to go and collect the people of Israel from their slavery in Egypt and bring them out. And Moses asks for God's name. Whom shall I say, say has sent me? And God eventually says, I am who I am. Notice it's present tense. So God is always present. But that's God's own name for himself. And from that point onwards, no Jew is allowed to say those words. The sacred tetragrammaton. They had to think of some way around those. If they had to use I am, they had to think of some, way, some other way to say it. So when Jesus is on trial and he says to the chief priest, you say, I am, Jesus is using God's own name for himself. So he is identifying himself with God. And the high priest rips his robe. Do we need any further evidence? From that point, he's committed to be crucified. Jesus identifies himself. I am. The first great assertion then is about the eternal existence of Christ as the word of God. In the beginning was the word. And the emphasis there falls on the word in. And on. Notice 
here though the word is in the beginning not from the beginning remember how infuriated you used to get with the English teacher or your Latin teacher the word is in the beginning that means that when things began to be the word the logos was already there you cannot go back in time and find a timeline of when God began so here we are dealing with the mystery of faith this is why he cannot just be a prophet this is why he just doesn't fit into the rigmarole of other gods it's not something we can dream up in the beginning he was there in the beginning absolute eternity has been asserted for the word so we can understand that the word the logos antedates comes before the beginning of everything he was there before anything else came into being that's a statement of faith and we have to make a statement of faith I can't prove it to you mathematically I've got no proof I can't dig it out from somewhere in the end we believe in God by faith it's a statement of faith The significance, the significance of this for us is to understand that the word, the Logos, was not made. Because when you've made something, you can manipulate it. And this is what God was always trying to reveal to ancient Israel about idols. Idols can be manipulated. He was not an idol. There's no use trying to manipulate God. He won't change the bottom line for you. He is independent of all of that. In the beginning, before anything else came to be, he was there already. And that's a, a statement of faith. We believe it or we don't. So that's John's first assert assertion. The second great assertion that John makes about the word is about the words eternal intercommunion with God. In the beginning was the word and now and the word was with God. When he says the word was with God that means that there was an immediate and close relationship between the word that's the logos and God that phrase with God doesn't just mean coexistence but it means an active relationship of intercourse and I'm going to continue to amplify here this absolute intimacy between the word of God the logos and God God the Father the Logos existing from all eternity exists for all eternity in intercommunion with God that is why we as Christians have such a high concept of marriage his eternal existence is not a solitary one there is a very intimate relationship here from all eternity the word subsisted alongside of God and I just want to come to that verse 18 which I'm not going to deal with today but you will see it if you go back to the reading from John's gospel when he says no one has ever seen God 
but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. You won't take time to think about that verse. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, that's the Logos, has made him known. That verse 18 slips very easily beneath the radar. From all eternity, the Word subsisted alongside God in personal intercommunion with Him. Here is the closest and most intimate relationship possible. And this relationship carries on in unbroken continuity. Now you can raise the question of the cry of dereliction. When Jesus is being crucified, He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we think that at that moment, God's abandoned him. You have to hear those words in the context of Psalm 22. Jesus is experiencing God's anger and wrath against the sin of the world. Because he is bearing the sin of the world. But Psalm 22 continues and ends on a note of triumph. So Jesus is feeling the anger and the wrath and the judgment of God against sin. That's the purpose of Him being on the cross. But it ends on a note of triumph and of victory. So that those words are, it's the Jesus is in an intimacy of communion that the word is declared to have eternally with God. He was not just a little messenger boy who was sent down here. He was not a prophet. He was the son of God. He was God. Now we come to the third assertion, and the word was God, which tells us of the eternal identity with God. So the word is not merely closely associated with God, he is God himself. This is an outrageous statement to make. Because how does God, who is all holiness and all purity, who can have nothing to do with sinfulness and dirt and grime, come down into this world and share our common lot, be born in a stable. And yet that is what God does in the form of His Son. This is what is so staggering about the Christian gospel and the the work that is declared about how God comes to save. God the Father, in all His purity, in all His holiness, in all His justice, in all His righteousness, remains on His throne in heaven. And God the Son comes to share our common dirty lot. But it is God coming to be with us it sets our faith apart from the rest of the world. So the word is not merely a close, uh, closely associated with God. He is God himself. It does sound complicated. But it needs to be said nonetheless. Because this is our orthodox Christian faith. Because it tells us exactly who Jesus is. It sounds bad maths, but it's good theology. Eternally existing alongside of and communion with God, the Word is not a separate being from God. 
This is the deep mystery. In some deep sense, he is distinct from God. He comes to be with us. But he is at the same time, in some high sense, identical with God. It's difficult for us to grasp that. It's a mystery of our faith. But it's the truth, and it's what we believe. John wishes us to understand that it's too little to say of the word that he's just God's co-eternal fellow. We must save him that he is the eternal God's very self. He is the eternal God's very self who came to be with us. Whatever makes God the being which we call God, John wants us to understand that that is what the word of God has always been and was when he came to be with us. So the word, the Logos, is with the utmost energy asserted to be what God is. It's difficult. We don't understand it all. That's why it's an act of faith. But God reveals himself. He is a self-revealing God. He revealed himself to Israel. And in his son, he has revealed himself to us fully. And you experience God. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And that is absolutely real. It's an act of faith, but God seals these things to our hearts and spirits by the work of his Holy Spirit. That is how he comes to be with us now. He seals these truths to us. He enables us to grasp these truths by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Even if we don't understand everything, we don't have to understand it all. We just have to have enough to believe and to help us. Some understand more than others. doesn't matter. But where do we go to get our vision? To build a new life. To build a new church. To build a new country. Do we go to Jesus, the Son of God? Or do we go to Somebody selling Lucky Pops. What country are we going to build? What church are we going to build? What life are you going to build? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He came to be with us. Amen. Let's make our offerings to God.